Why should Americans care about the ongoing political turmoil and violence in Pakistan right now? Well, it's the fifth biggest country in the world. It's got nuclear weapons. It was one of the front lines in the so-called war on terror. And it's currently considered by our government to be a major non-NATO ally. And yet ever since Imran Khan, the legendary Pakistani cricketer turned populist politician, was ejected from the Prime Minister's office last year in a very controversial parliamentary vote of no confidence, that country has been in the midst of an historic political and economic crisis. Khan, who remains hugely popular inside of Pakistan, has had more than 100 criminal cases thrown at him, from corruption to terrorism to blasphemy. And there has also been a vicious crackdown against members of his own political party. Khan's violent arrest outside a courthouse in May, later deemed by Pakistan's Supreme Court to be illegal, led to mass protests, to violence and death across the country. According to Human Rights Watch, while some of Khan's supporters did use violence and attacked property and the police, the Pakistani authorities, quote, used excessive force against protesters, restricted access to the internet and to social media, and carried out mass arrests. More than 4,000 people detained, many of them arbitrarily. But what was so stunning about those protests is that they, is that they weren't just anti-government, they even challenged the dominance of the once-revered, almost untouchable Pakistani army. See, that country of more than 250 million people, which has long aspired to be a functioning democracy, has been ruled, directly or indirectly, by the military for most of its 75 years of independence. Currently, the Pakistani military has banned any mention of Imran Khan's name on air. Prominent journalists have just disappeared. Even Pakistani-American fashion designer Khadija Shah has been detained for taking part in the protests. And Khan himself, who survived an assassination attempt last November, is worried for his own life. The former prime minister, who is accused of cozying up to Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, hasn't had much support, though, from Western capitals. And he himself accused the Biden administration of being behind a coup against him, an allegation that the State Department has denied and that Khan has since backed away from. So what should America be doing here? And what does the future hold for Pakistan and for Imran Khan? Earlier, I spoke to the former prime minister of Pakistan and chairman of the political party, the PTI. Imran Khan, thank you for coming on the show. You are the former Prime Minister of Pakistan. Explain to our viewers watching in America tonight what you believe is the state of democracy, of freedom, of human rights in Pakistan tonight. How bad is it? Well, maybe for some, some of us who've seen the evolution of our democracy over the last, especially 20 years, because you saw General Musharraf's martial law, and then in that martial law, we saw what was called the lawyers' movement for the independence of judiciary. And during that time, the media asserted its independence. So we were moving towards a democratic system. Two governments came in, stood for five years, and then left elections. Another government took over. So we're moving towards, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, what we hoped would be genuine democracy, because normally we had a hybrid system. Even when the army was not in power, they really controlled the levers from behind. But what is happening right now is a, a total dismantling of our democracy. It's not a question of what is happening to my party or to me, uh, or these 170 cases and so on, or whether I'm in jail or these are not one, but two assassination attempts on me. It's what is happening to the future of this country if our democracy is disbanded, because the rule of law, democracy and prosperity go hand in hand. When you do not have a rule of law, which is what is happening now, it is might is right. There's an yeah. undeclared martial law in Pakistan. Then, you know, the, the, there's darkness ahead. We are standing on the so, edge of darkness. So what is your message to the American government tonight, to President Joe Biden? Because on the one hand, you have urged the U.S. to speak out in the name of democracy and human rights against what's happening in Pakistan right now. But you've also accused the U.S. of being behind a, quote, foreign conspiracy, a coup against you. You've repeatedly called what happened to you, quote, U.S.-backed regime change. Well, I mean, the facts about the, what happened, about me receiving a cipher coded message from a from a ambassador in washington this is uh, uh, 6 march 22 
which said that the American official under Secretary of State telling the ambassador in an official meeting that unless you get rid of Imran Khan in a vote of no confidence, there'll be consequences. And then the vote of confidence, no confidence takes place the next day. And within weeks, my government is gone. So I merely stated the facts. And by the way, I put the cipher in front of the cabinet, in front of the um, National Security Council, and there was an official protest from Pakistan for interfering in our internal affairs. But that's behind me. Look, all I want the U.S. to do is the professed aims of so-called Western values of democracy, rule of law, human rights. They shouldn't worry about what is happening to me. They should worry about 250 million people. The, the, the whole democratic structure is being wound up. And we, as I said, we have an undeclared martial law. Surely, so, this is not what the Western countries should want. I mean, they should just speak about, speak out against it. So obviously, the Biden administration denies uh, being involved uh, in your ejection from power. The current Pakistani government is clearly afraid of you. Hence, the mass arrests, the talk of banning your party, the more than 150 legal cases against you. They've said you're a bigger threat to the country than Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, rather ridiculously. Do you believe that if elections are held on time in October of this year, that your besieged party can still win and that you can still be Prime Minister again? Surely that's a pipe dream now. Look, out of the, since I've been ousted, out of the 37 by-elections held, 30 have been swept by, by my party, despite the total support of the establishment to these 12-party coalition. So clearly they are scared. This whole thing which, is, which happened to us after 9th May when I was abducted from within the high court, abduction, and the way that they abducted me as if I was some terrorist. So the reaction to that was used as a way of just clamping down, crack down on my party. We equated to what Hitler did after the 1933 burning of the German parliament. He cracked down on the communists and wiped them out. This is what's happening now. How could a few cases of arson be made a reason for five, 10,000 of our workers in jail? And every day people are being put in, my entire leadership is in jail. The only way the leadership can come out of jail if they renounce become being part of my party. So it's never happened so, in this country before. Women have never been put in jail. The entire media has been muzzled. I mean, the military, which is the real power in Pakistan, is obviously out to get you. It was army rangers who arrested you outside the courthouse, not police. It's military officials who have told, uh, reportedly told Pakistani journalists not to mention your name on air. Yet your critics would say that you came to power in 2018, everyone knows this, in alliance with that same military, that you for years had close relations with top generals going all the way back to Hamid Gul, the former head of the Pakistani ISI. So the critics would say it's ironic to see you now criticizing the same army and intelligence chiefs who you were once fine with and who helped put you in power in the first place. Firstly, just to correct you, I was abducted by the rangers from within the court. I was actually sitting in the courtroom. So, you know, just to correct you. Um, and the Supreme Court declared it illegal. And so yes. I was, that's why I was bailed out. Um, look, in Pakistan, Mehdi, the military has directly or indirectly ruled Pakistan for 70 years. Three times martial law and then the other times through in because they're entrenched. And so whoever does politics has to work with them. Now, when I came to power in 2018, it wasn't because the military engineered to get me into power. They didn't oppose me. Big difference. In 2013, before that, they actually helped the Shrif get into power and we proved in the, in the rigged elections. In 2018, we asked everyone to open the elections because we came through proper free and fair elections. In fact, we felt we lost some seats. But the thing is, I work with the military. I mean, I work, military means the army chief. So I work yeah. pretty well with him. The, pro the main problem was, you see, I, my whole thing is rule of law. I started my movement for justice 27 years ago, wanting to bring the powerful mafias, the political mafias under the law. 
This is yeah. where the problem became. You know, he but, didn't think corruption was that big a thing. You know, he wasn't interested in. And if he had a, and he had the veto power. So that's where I failed. Although we succeeded economically, we did brilliantly dealing with uh, the pandemic. But I failed in the rule you, of law. And I think that's where the problems became. Up next, what about the criticisms of Imran Khan's own time in office? Don't go away. Before the break, I was speaking with former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. We discussed the state of democracy in his country and his message to the American government. But what about the criticisms he's faced from his own time in office? Here's the rest of my interview with him. You have been praised in your handling of the pandemic, and it's interesting to hear you saying you failed in terms of the military. But while there are many Pakistanis who still support you, you're hugely popular, a lot of Pakistanis say, hold on, when you were in government, you were fine with the military. You say none of this stuff has happened before, but you locked up opposition leaders, you locked up journalists, you cracked down on the press, and now you're getting upset that the same is being done to you. Uh, look, you know, the, the term false equivalence you cannot compare what was going on in my time to this in fact general musharraf martial law was more liberal than what is happening right now i mean in our time you can just name me which channel did we close i mean which journalists left the country four of our top journalists have left the country one a fifth one was wrote a letter to the supreme court chief justice that his, his life was in danger he escaped. He was killed in Kenya. Our Understood. best journalist right now, you know, uh, Arshad Sharif, and best uh, Imran Riaz, he's disappeared for 40 days. Yes. I mean, he's there. And, you, you know, but Chairman so Khan, you I, I'm, a I, I'm not going to dispute. I'm not going to dispute what's happening now. I'm very critical of what this government's done. It's not about equivalence, though. It's about that on your watch, you did a lot of these things, maybe not as badly as the current government, but Reporters Without Borders, for example. They called you a press freedom predator in 2021. They criticized you at the time for threatening, abducting, and torturing journalists. That happened on your watch. Hamid Mir, a very famous Pakistani journalist, he wrote just last month for The Guardian that when you were in office, he wasn't out on air, even though you had once called him a favorite anchor. So the problem is that a lot of this stuff did happen on your watch. You were not a champion of the free press. So people say, hold on, now you're saying it's bad when it happens against you. Firstly, uh, Mehdi, the only time that I found out about a journalist being picked up and disappeared was a guy called Mathieu Lajan. The next day I got him back. The problems we had were we were at the tail end of the war on terror. And the, the establishment was very worried about any criticism about it. So they were responsible for a few guys who were picked up. But this is nothing compared to what's going on. The only thing what we tried to do was to, there was fake news on social media and that was you know, causing havoc because there would be slandering people and so on. That's the only thing we tried. But when there was opposition from the media, we didn't even bring those laws in. But again, I mean, there is no comparison what is happening right now. Uh, my name cannot be mentioned on media. I they, you, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. When you were prime minister, Nawaz Sharif's name couldn't be mentioned on air either. That's what your critics would say. You no, did the same thing to Nawaz Sharif. Not at all. No, look, Nawaz Sharif was a con convicted by the Supreme Court. He then faked these illnesses and somehow managed to uh, bring out these tests which said he was about to do die. Then, then his brother gave an affidavit that he's just going two weeks for treatment to come back. A, a convict. He goes to England and suddenly all illnesses disappear and then he starts giving lectures to Pakistan. He was a convict. You can't okay. compare what, what was happening to me. I'm not convicted but the media of anything. Couldn't, but the media I couldn't say his name. I'm, I'm no fan of Nawaz Sharif. I'm just saying his name couldn't be mentioned on air. We're almost out of time, but I've got to ask, do you have any regrets about what you did in office, especially with the military, given what the military is now doing against you? What would you go back and do differently if you could? Last question. Well, just uh, uh, firstly, I, uh, given you know uh, what happened after I came into power, I should have actually, with a weak coalition government, uh, you know, I should not have taken power. I should have gone for elections again. Uh, and because you can't bring reforms and changes, and especially rule of law, if you have a weak government. 
And if I have to do it again, look, they, this hybrid system cannot work. If you are an elected prime minister, you must have the authority to implement your reforms. It cannot work that you have the responsibility because you're elected, but the authority is shared and the, other, the, the army chief has a veto power. This sort of system is doomed to failure. And Pakistan, what it faces right now, huge economic problems, the worst economic yeah. situation in our country. Unless we fix the, the governance system through rule of law, I'm afraid, you know, the, the country is on the edge of darkness. There is no doubt uh, there is a massive political and economic crisis in Pakistan right now. We appreciate you taking time out to speak to us, and I do hope you stay thank safe. You. Imran Khan, former Prime thank Minister you. of Pakistan, thank you.